to the Introduction to Soft Tissue Mobilization. I'm Dr. Tamara Hefron, Doctor of Physical Therapy and also Board Certified Orthopedic Specialist. Excited to bring to you just a few videos and um, demonstrations of some techniques. We do recommend that if you can do this with a partner, that you would probably get more out of it. If you can't, that's okay. Maybe at some point just get someone to work on and with so you can go through some of the videos and techniques that we show you today and get some feedback and practice. So indications, what do you guys think? What would be some indications for some soft tissue mobilization? Well, our patients and clients most likely are coming into us in an orthopedic setting complaining of pain or dysfunction. So that is what we would use soft tissue mobilization for is to address pain, which would be on any scale. It could be mild to even severe pain. Severe pain, would we would have to ease up a little bit, uh, making sure that we're using some of our lighter techniques, not causing more inflammatory process or more damage to, to the tissues. Um, and then if we think about dysfunction, we can think about that in multiple facets, right? So if we look at the guy on the right, he's just rolled his ankle, or girl, it might be a girl, I'm not sure. But uh, so what are we thinking there? Well, we're probably going to address swelling and edema. Um, we're trying to restore functionality for that patient. Uh, let's just say it was a drastic accident, they had surgery, we'll spend some time working on their scar, not only for mobilization, but really more for desensitization of the area and, the, and then also mobilization of the tissues around the area. Now, there's a lot out there that says that we're breaking down or reducing adhesions or that we're lengthening muscles and tendons. To be honest, guys, the research right now is um, very uh, weak in that aspect. What we do have is basic science, and we understand uh, the fascial system is made up of water, and so we can think about that we're probably moving water through different areas, but... There are some videos that show breaking up of tissue and what that is. And if you think about a manipulation under anesthesia, that's breaking up scar tissue. So it can be done, just limited evidence on the efficacy of it. More, more evidence supporting the fact that we're doing a neurophysiological phenomenon in, in treating someone and also the great support that there is out there for the healing aspects of touch. Uh, on the left, you'll see a picture of a trigger point. The big red spots are what we see under a microscope of what a trigger point looks like. So we call that a myofascial bundle. So we can use some techniques for that. We'll show you that in a little bit. Absolute contraindications. Please refer for any testing purposes to Dr. Summer's lecture. She will um, be the gold standard in relationship to that. But just a review, please do not do... Um, tissue work if someone's got it at bacterial infection or systemized uh, syst systemic localized inf infection. Um, malignancy that uh, for us is really an absolute. You guys will come to discover though that at some points you're gonna you're gonna say, well, what if they have um, skin cancer? Can I still do soft tissue mobilization? So there's always going to be a little bit of working room within that. Sutures over the area. So if someone comes in with recent surgery, please do not um, do any soft tissue unless those are removed and the scar is healed. Now you can do above and below. That's actually really effective and can help your patient out with that. You can read some of through the rest of those. Just make sure you, you understand and know those. Um, one of the things I want you guys to take away though is advanced diabetes. So why do you think that we don't want to do soft tissue mobilization on someone with advanced diabetes? So what comes to mind for you guys should be the integrity of their skin. So they have really poor uh, wound healing. And then also that they start to get what we would call diabetic neuropathy, meaning that they're losing sensation, especially in their distal aspects of their limbs. So using a significant caution with that. Um, we want to make sure that we don't have an inappropriate end feel and also pain unrelieved by rest would be that one of those red flags that you're going to really slow down, ask a lot more questions, make sure your patient's appropriate to be there. Relative, so when I say relative, I always use pregnancy. Pregnancy meaning that you have to really make sure you uh, cross your 
uh, T's and dot your I's and really make sure that you've done a thorough examination, deemed them appropriate for whatever intervention that you're going to choose. That would include soft tissue mobilization because you would never want to be guilty by association. You would never want to cause harm. And so if you're unsure, you just want to take a little bit more caution that way. Hypermobility, guys, doesn't mean that you won't, right? Because with hypermobility can, can come some different dysfunction, especially in their movement patterns and things like that. They might need soft tissue work for um, really more effleurage, relaxation type of techniques uh, or even pain modulation. But they also might need it because there are some areas that are, are trying to counteract that significant hypermobility. Presence of neurological signs, again, you're going to slow down your examination, but it really can help with people with ridiculous symptoms. So we think about oftentimes they have what we call a double crush scenario where they're getting compression at their spinal level, so like say in the cervical spine, but they're all also getting compression of the nerve in the periphery. So using some of your soft tissue techniques can vastly improve their symptoms and their outcomes. Um, with effusion and inflammation, you're going to always kind of flush the area. So you're working towards the heart just like you would if you were to tape or to wrap someone with that. With other some of our systemic diseases or disorders, please just use caution. Uh, slow down. Don't do a lot in the beginning. And then, and then as you get to know them and as you get to know their responses, then add some of that back in. Dizziness is just a, can, can be a sign of other neurological um, impairment. So again, we just want you to slow down with that. Now the application parameters. If you think about, there's so many different types. We can, there's a picture right here showing you an instrument assisted uh, type of soft tissue mobilization. Uh, that one looks rather aggressive. I'm not sure I'd love to have that done to me, but um, just keep that in mind. We're going to think about type. So you might document it as Instrument assisted soft tissue mobilization. You might document it as myofascial release or MFR, trigger point release, TPR. Uh, you might even think about that you're going to do a pin and stretch or use strain, counter strain technique. So make sure you document the type that you're doing. Duration, if you remember back to your properties of soft, soft tissue and understanding that tissue will start to recoil after 15 minutes of that same stimuli. So if you're spending a lot of time, 15 minutes in the same area doing the same thing, it's probably too long. So move around, do a lot of test retests, get the patient up and on and off the table if they're not uh, severe and irritable, and retest out if you're actually making a difference or not. Force is really important. In some of the videos, you're, you'll hear me ask how much pressure that is. We often use a scale 0 to 10, 10 being like the most pressure. They can experience that. It's way too much. It's probably not going to solve a lot in the body. Um, make sure that your force matches the expected um, response, meaning that if I think I'm giving a 4 out of 4, I might want my patient to say the same thing because there's good elasticity under there. As you get into an area where there's increased tension or increased restriction, it's going to um, feel worse to your patient. So you might be applying the same force, but the tissue isn't quite as healthy. So you're going to make sure that as you go, you're working on a continuum with your patient and with your rationale so that you make sure that you have a good rationale for that. Your patient and client position is often going to drive your position and the technique that you can and should apply. So in this video, we're just going to go over the setup, how to set it up, how to do some draping. So if you need to, get grab some pillowcases so that you can follow along. We're going to do an introduction to soft tissue massage today. A couple key things that you're going to need. You'll probably need some pillowcases that will help with your draping. You're going to need uh, some lotion that easily glides. So we often will use free up. There's an organic version of that that doesn't have any, um, you know, extra things in there, no scents or anything like that. So we recommend that you do that. Uh, Kelly, we have Kelly here. She volunteered to get a little bit of a back massage today. So thank you, Kelly. First and foremost is uh, we like to drape the patient just for safety and for comfort for them. So. Uh, Kelly, you mind if I lift your shirt up a little bit? No. Okay, great. So I received permission from her. Kelly, I'm going to just tuck the sheet down and just drape your 
drape your back so that just your back is exposed. Okay. okay. So I'm going to use the sheet, tuck it down, and then come just right above where the sacrum is. So now I have a nice, nice canvas here. I'm going to use that the same with her sports bra to open up her um, skin that's exposed. But you see how now she's draped so she feels comfortable there. Now I can use that. I tuck the pillowcase in and I pull up. So now I can use this even as an anchor for myself as I'm doing some tissue massage that way. Great. We're going to do other areas throughout your uh, whole coursework and in other courses that we do. But again, it's just really important to maintain that barrier for you, for, for your patient, and to maintain um, just coverage so your patient feels the most relaxed that they can. Now we're going to go over lotion application. So you'll need some lotion. You'll also need a tongue depressor. And just, uh, again, follow along. Okay, so we're going to talk about lotion application. We recommend that you use a popsicle stick or a tongue depressor so that you're not reaching your hands into the, the jar every time that you're doing it. Make sure you set that over and away. If you have a cart to put things on, probably a good idea. Try not to sit in on your stool because you know what might happen. You might sit on your stool. So um, I like to put my lotion on the back of my hand. That Now I have lotion ready for her and I can... Monitor how much lotion I actually put on her. So because I'm putting uh, lotion on her back, I'm going to take my fingertips. I'm going to warm the lotion up in my hands first. So I'm not just going to take cold lotion and slap it on her. That's not good. Don't do that. Nice and warm in your hands. Then you're going to nice and easy place the lotion on your patient so that it's a nice firm pressure. And then you're using this not only to spread the lotion on her, but you're using it as an assessment tool. So remember, I've done this a lot, so I have, in my head, I can do a lot of information at one time. For you, what we recommend is that you apply in a single plane and go with the muscle fibers so you can feel how that feels. As you notice, I do almost what we call an airplane method. So I'm not going straight on and I'm not straight over her. I have my body at an angle. I'm bracing myself against her. I do a nice, easy pressure. So I'm now warming up the tissues, but I'm also getting her used to what my hand feels like. It doesn't feel good for your patient to really go firm into there, so that nice gentle glide helps out. Same thing when you're done. So you see, if I go as far as I can up Kelly's back and then come back down, now she mentally kind of knows that I'm done with that swipe uh, through the tissue, and she's it's not an abrupt ending. So rather than this big, and now I'm just going this, like we're not petting a cat, okay? So nice and easy this way. Good. So you guys just make sure that you're applying that um, technique and especially warming up the tissues. So spend some time to warm up the tissues. Make sure your your body is really adapting and responding to some of the techniques that you're doing before we do some of the other techniques we're going to look at next. This is a deeper technique. Uh, again, making sure that you remember that viscosity is really important of the tissue and the fascial system and that it responds when it's much warmer. So now we're going to move into a more a deep tissue massage, so what we would call myofascial release. So I think about Kelly's fascial system. She has a nice, long fascial system that comes along the two sides of her spine. Then we also have this, we have a system that wraps around the front of her hips, so we know that there's a cross-section as we come into her hips. So for this, I can do effleurage, but it's not really a technique that I know I'm going to change the surface. I'm calming symptoms down with that. This, I'm going to find where there's uh, increased tension at, or maybe there's what we would call um, an increased myofascial bundle. Uh, a lot of our patients would say they have a knot. Um, you're going to brace against here. You're going to use the lateral aspect of your elbow. You're going to start with your hips back and behind you, and you're going to apply a gentle force into the body before you even start moving. As you go along, you're going to gently apply more pressure into the body by just shifting your weight onto your front leg. Now, if you notice, I'm a little too far behind. I can't really move up, so I'm going to move my feet closer. I'm still in that same position, 
But I'm going to apply pressure to Kelly, and I'm going to ask her how much, on a scale from 0 to 10, pressure am I giving you right now? Like a 4. Okay, like a 4. So and in my mind, that matches what I wanted to do for her. It's my first time through with this more increased pressure technique. We call it maybe the forearm technique or the elbow technique. I have to shift a little bit because as I go onto her ribs, I want to make sure that I'm on tissue and that I'm not pinching into bone. And that probably increased a little bit because I can feel more tension underneath my hands. So we're probably at like maybe a six, mm -hmm. right? Yep. And I'm going to go nice and slow because we need to allow the tissue time to actually change underneath that surface of your hand. As you reach your end destination, come back in with some of your effleurage and calm that system down. You're going to choose to do maybe one to three strong swipes and then you might come back in with some of your easier techniques. Good. So you guys make sure that you're really appropriate and that you go nice and slow when you do that. You got to allow the tissue to adapt underneath you um, and allow your patient to adapt for pain. Keep checking in. Very, very important to keep checking in. Okay, this technique is really great for um, some musculotendinous junction and really more for improved range of motion rather than pain modulation. Whoops, let's go back. We're going to show you a pin and stretch technique. We're going to add a little oscillation into that as well. So let's say that Kelly has some biceps tightness or tendonitis or something that we need to address that her biceps are really creating some impairment. So I'm going to get into that same position. I've already put lotion on her, done my nice effleurage with her. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to shorten where we're at, get onto that tendinous junction and then I'm going to actually pin that down and then go into a nice stretch for her. That should feel pretty strong, right? But it should be tolerable. I don't want that to be too strong that she's wincing in pain and recoiling. I can do that three to five times. Then I can go all the way up and through. But I can add in now some oscillation to really help that muscle length improve and then that fascial system start to improve. I need to be careful as I move up into where that biceps, that long head of the biceps come because that's going to be very tender. So I'm not going to jam my arm into that. So if I think about this technique, it's really the muscle belly down into where I have an insertion point that I'm going to pin and stretch and add some oscillation into that. So again, more for range of motion improvement rather than pain. So just keep that in mind. And there's multiple areas in the body you'll use this, and it's a really, really effective tool for you guys. This is Dr. Summer. She's going to show us some scar tissue mobilization. Okay, so now we're going to talk about assessing a scar. So as you can tell, uh, this scar is really pretty old. It's completely healed. So one of the things you're going to do is just assess not only along the scar, but also the tissue right next to it. Okay, another thing you're going to do is try to separate the fascial layers and do a little bit of rolling of the skin. See how bound down it is. See if there's any keloid or fibrosis that's really sticking that, that whole fascial system together. So if you find an area that's a little bit bound down, you can obviously roll it. You can do a little bit more of an aggressive swipe with a lot more pressure through it to try to help that tissue lay down in a more organized fashion. It's also important to do what's called J strokes or even just bending of the scar. So I'm kind of bending it in the frontal plane. I'm going to reverse that to really help that tissue be a little bit more flexible. Another thing that you can do is do little circles to help break up fibrosis. So we're going to go clockwise. We're going to go counterclockwise. All this is also helping with desensitization if that's something they need. They may have a scar that's really sensitive, so make sure you're communicating with your patient. You can also do swipes in different planes of motion. Remember, fascia is omnidirectional, so it's important to take that into consideration. So one thing I want you guys to remember, so I, my scar is very old right there, but when it first happened, I went to physical therapy probably six months after I had my second surgery, and 
Going through the desensitization process for my scar was one of the worst parts of therapy. Um, and not only did my physical therapist help me with that, but then I was given homework to do. So really don't want you guys to forget that. It's really important that you give your patient the strategies and the um, responsibility to work on that. And it's really important so that they don't suffer from that, and it also helps in the in the future reduce the risk of getting what um, uh, like complex regional pain syndrome or CRIPS. So just keep that in mind and make sure you're giving your patient some of those as well. Okay, this is our last technique: trigger point release. Um, a lot of patients will want this because they'll they'll think that that's kind of what they need, right? Their mecca of pain is at that at that specific site. So it's effective, but a lot of times, guys, you might want to use this after you use some of your other techniques. Um, and if you get certified in dry needling, this is it's really much more evidence-based and effective to use um, dry needling for. You can still use your manual technique, but uh, if you have the choice, you're going to choose dry needling over your, your hands to perform this. In this, you'll see that we add some movement, and it does help to, to change the stimuli a little bit for your patient. We're going to talk about some trigger point release. Oftentimes, trigger point release is done with just a 90-degree angle and significant pressure on that trigger point. How's that feel, Kale? It's good. Yeah. A lot of people, they don't really love that because it kind of turns into that like bad, bad feeling instead of a good, bad, meaning that it's productive. Your patient might say that it's productive. We need that buy-in from your patient. That's what's going to create some change. It's also a really good pain science technique to throw in. But so much of pain is related to how our brain perceives it. So if we do find a trigger point, so on Kelly, we can we can find one. So we can see that there's, there's not um, a lot of elasticity underneath that, right, when I press on there versus if I'm up here. You guys see the difference on that? So I'm here. I'm going to hold on to that. But right now, she's lengthened in that tissue because her scapula is protracted. So as I go, I'm going to apply uh, about a three to four pressure. So how does that feel, Kel? Okay. But I'm going to increase that pressure because I'm trying to get that neurovascular bundle to turn off. So I'm going to increase that. I'm going to bring her into retraction. And now I'm going to have her breathe with me. So go ahead and breathe in. Good, and then as she breathes out, we're going to apply a little bit of that oscillation. It helps the patient feel a little bit better. Good, and then out. Good, and then I'm going to come off, and then I might apply some of my easier gentle techniques because remember that omnidirectional fascia is going to respond a little bit better, and that already feels better to me. How about you, Kel? Good. Great, so you guys just keep that in your back pocket. Um, just know that it's not the only thing that you should be doing, nor should it be the um, biggest priority for you. Um, a lot of times a trigger point also is going to be around maybe an area that would benefit from a manipulation. So as you learn manipulations, you might start with that. It's a really good neural reset and then do some of your, your techniques around that. Okay, summary. First and foremost, please educate and receive permission from your patient. Second, make sure that you're appropriately covering your patient up, um, that they're not exposed in abnormal ways, and that you feel comfortable and they feel comfortable. Go back and review your soft tissue properties so that you have a good rationale for what you're doing and why you're doing it. Check in frequently. Make sure that the response matches what you want and what the expected finding is. And then again, come back to education. All right, great job, you guys. We'll do more techniques in lab. This is a great introduction for you, and just keep referring back, and as always, keep practicing.